Good evening, folks. Um, Peter Moulton. I'm with the State Energy Office, which, as you all may know, uh, in Washington State is within our Department of Commerce. I'm the state's bioenergy policy coordinator. I've been there for about 12 years. And so tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, renewable natural gas development. We've spent quite a bit of time uh, looking at this uh, in the last couple of years. So I'm going to go through some of our analysis, um, some of the policy framework that's ever evolving in Washington State around natural gas, and then uh, try to extrapolate a little bit on the significance for Whatcom County. So just a quick reminder of what is renewable natural gas. This, this diagram is not as complex as it looks. It's pretty straightforward. Um, basically, as, as, you, as you know, natural gas, uh, when it's in the pipeline system out here, for example, is about 97% methane, a few other inert gases and some other things in it. But it's pretty much uh, methane. So when you have organic waste that decomposes in an anaerobic environment, so in an oxygen-constrained environment, you have methane generated, and that's what we call biogas. So sometimes that's coming off of landfills or wastewater treatment plants. Uh, it can come off of any organic waste stream um, that decomposes uh, anaerobically, and then the content of methane within that biogas will vary roughly between 40 and 70 percent. Uh, then, depending on what you want, how you want to use that biogas downstream, you may have to condition or what we call scrub that gas to certain quality standards. Um, if you're just going to use it for process heat or to generate power, then you don't have to do a whole lot of cleanup. If you want to use it for on-site natural gas vehicle fueling, then you have to do some additional cleanup. If you're going to put it in the pipeline system, then it has to meet quality standards for the receiving pipeline, and that's usually the highest tier. So depending on your end use, um, it has to be conditioned in different ways. So when we look around the state of where is biogas being generated, how is it being used, a lot of the focus over the last decade plus has been around dairies. Um, because on-site dairy digesters have been a way to uh, mitigate uh, waste management challenges for some of the dairies, uh, as well as there was a lot of um, uh, economic opportunity around on-site power generation and power purchase agreements. Puget Sound Energy, for example, uh, provided fairly reasonable power purchase agreements for a lot of the original dairy digesters that we stood up. Those are the, uh, the purple ones you see there, and you can see the concentration in northwest Washington. We'll talk about that model and why it's changing in the future. Uh, the one digester we have right now on the east side of the mountains is the one you see down south of Yakima. It's the largest one, and that one is in the process of switching over to pipeline injection. The other ones are still based on um, power sales model. Another opportunity is in landfills, and right now Cedar Hills landfill in King County and the Roosevelt big landfill um, down south both are doing pipeline injection of their renewable natural gas, so they have to clean that up to pipeline standard. Um, the LRI landfill in Pierce County, um, they're right now doing power generation, but they want to switch over to uh, powering their uh, uh, refuse trucks. Uh, Horn Rapids by Tri-Cities is very interested, a lot of opportunities. Wastewater treatment is a, is a better opportunity in some ways because it doesn't have the sort of uh, limited lifespan and challenges of gas collection that a landfill has because wastewater treatment is around in theory in perpetuity pretty much. However, it's greatly diluted, so it's not as much volumetrically. But you'll see the South Treatment Plant in Renton, uh, the Central Treatment Plant in Tacoma, both are um, uh, either in the process or already doing pipeline injection. Uh, the lot treatment plant in Olympia does uh, combined heat and power. Yakima and Spokane are interested as well. And so in 2017, we partnered with our neighbors at the WCU Energy Extension in Olympia to look at, well, how much potential is there in RNG? And so came out with a report, it's a couple years old now, that was more painterly. It was more like, well, in theory, it should be kind of around these numbers. Uh, and it has the potential to maybe displace about 8 or 9% of our current natural gas usage for power and uh, heat. If you get into more advanced ways of producing uh, renewable natural gas, which would be like gasification of wood waste, and then you reformulate that into methane, then potentially you might be able to double it. But it was kind of a rough idea. And out of that study, we found that you know, the, the power sales model is mature shall we say. It's, it's, it's no longer really providing the economic incentive to make digester operations pencil out very well for the dairy community, which was the first initial target. 
that really it's moving into the renewable natural gas market for transportation, driven largely by the carbon-weighted clean fuel standards in California and Oregon, and also to some degree up in BC. Also, the incentives around digesters, renewable natural gas, and so on, were uh, either expiring or they were, they were conflicting. Uh, definitions had problems. There was a the whole problem of the uh, natural gas utilities, be they distribution or uh, transmission utilities, having very different quality standards. There's no uniform state or national standards to follow. And the policy framework was a little unresolved as well. So the session before last, in 2018, we sponsored a bill that restored and expanded incentives around production of renewable natural gas. Um, we said, um, fund us and we'll do a much broader, realistic, techno-economic assessment of RNG potential in the state. Um, update some of the policy options to have that conversation. Look at requiring public sector preferential purchasing for renewable natural gas and then engage with the gas utilities, renewable natural gas developers, the regulators, and so on in a conversation about can we voluntarily adopt some pipeline quality standards to help facilitate getting more renewable natural gas into the existing gas distribution system. So that bill passed, and we spent about a year working on a more thorough roadmap about RNG development, where we refined the previous production estimates talked about various benefits, um, how to integrate with gas utilities, and, and a discussion of policy options as well. And so the approach we took was to say the value in renewable natural gas is to getting it into the pipeline system because of the high value, uh, the, because of the low carbon intensity, therefore the high market value of renewable natural gas in transportation in Oregon and California and BC. So, um, that's why the large-scale biogas generators like the treatment plant in Seattle or Roosevelt Landfill and so on, they're all injecting into the pipeline system is they're what's called wheeling. I'm sure you're probably familiar with the concept of wheeling. You've been doing it with green power probably. Same idea as um, once it's in the system, it's, it's a molecule of methane, but the green attributes get sold into the marketplace and they have high value down south an order of magnitude greater than if you were to do power sales to your local utility. So everybody wants to get the renewable natural gas into the pipeline so they can wheel it into California and get a great deal uh, better return on it. So we said, okay, let's look around Washington at existing facilities that can be broadly defined, so that's wastewater treatment plants, landfills, composting operations, transfer stations, things that could, you know, public resources that could be part of a renewable natural gas production um, strategy. Let's look for those within five miles of the pipeline. And then let's look at high quality feedstocks that might be, contribute to natural gas production within about a 30 mile haul radius or so. And that will hopefully help inform where public-private partnering could take place to help stimulate more renewable natural gas. Challenge, of course, is that there's no consistent data sets about all these different organic waste streams and so on. So we had to do a lot of reverse engineering of wastewater permits and uh, economic data and so on. But here's what we came up with in the geographic information system that we set up. Starting with large dairies, and you can see the concentration up in Whatcom, and then over in um, Yakima, and then over in the uh, uh, Grant County area as well. But also, where are there other dairies within relative proximity to those dairies, such that you could run a slurry line or a low-pressure biogas line or something from one dairy to another, have a common conditioning facility that then ties into the pipeline? So we kind of rounded that out a little bit. Then we looked at other sources of, of animal waste, renderers, uh, large-scale egg producers, um, uh, combined animal feeding operations. Basically, where is there a lot of organic waste coming out of uh, animal management? And you can see you've got, um, you've got a rendering facility, a couple of them actually up in Whatcom and some beef operations that, again, could be producing feedstocks that you could go into a digester of some form to generate biogas. And then we said, okay, what about hatcheries? Because, you know, hatcheries often have waste. Um, add those to the picture. And then fruit growers and breweries and distillers, so opportunities to look at, you know, substantial amounts of waste. 
and food processors. And here what we're really looking for is both volume of, of food waste, from food processing waste, but especially high energy content. So that's oils and seafood. Whatcom County, big opportunity around seafood waste. So then you line that up with the facilities because if you want, you don't necessarily want to have to do a greenfields project and build a brand new, you know, industrial scale digester from scratch. If you can add a digester to a wastewater treatment plant or um, expand an industrial wastewater treatment plant over here to take some other um, feedstocks and so on. The challenge in Whatcom is that none of your existing wastewater facilities, to my knowledge, including Post Point, actually have digesters. Um, digesters you usually see at very large urban uh, wastewater treatment plants that have to handle heavy volumes. So um, incorporating biogas generation and renewable natural gas production in Whatcom through wastewater would require adding digesters to your wastewater treatment. And there's no currently open landfills in Whatcom either that you could tap. But you can see where they are around the state and so on. It's part of our analysis. And then we looked at composters, and certainly you have composting up here and other sources of public infrastructure. So, of course, all relative to the, again, the blue outline of the existing primary gas uh, network. So then we started to marry these things up. Where are all the high value, the high volume animal wastes in general, relative to food processing, and so on. So that's the tool we have right now. <coughs> Excuse me. And then as part of this, we started to look at, okay, statewide, where realistically, how much renewable natural gas might we be producing? At current volumes, those two landfills we talked about and the South Treatment Plant in Renton displace about 1.3% of current usage. Now, all of that is getting wheeled virtually into the California market where it gets value, but that's just to give you a sense of scale. We estimated that in the near term, roughly five years, with a substantial amount of investment, picking up additional landfills. I'm not going to go through all this because you folks can, can look at the details later. But in the near term, with a substantial investment, maybe another 1.8%. And then over the following five years, again, with some substantial investment, you might get about another 1.9%. So the bottom line is using existing sources of organic waste and conventional means of generating biogas, utilizing public facilities, you could get to about 5% displacement of current natural gas use. Not a whole lot, to be frank. You can double that if you get into, again, wood waste gasification. There's also power to gas. There's other advanced technologies. Not going to be cheap, but they, they could potentially develop more RNG. Now, this last session, there were a whole bunch of things that came into play or are currently in play that affect the marketplace around um, RNG. First and foremost, um, the gas utilities now have to uh, comply with or will be having to comply. The Utilities and Transportation Commission still has to establish targets and go through rules and so on, but a new conservation standard. And so as part of complying with that, they can propose a renewable natural gas program. And this is all has to be worked out with UTC and so on still. But they must also offer a voluntary RNG program to their retail customers. So much like um, utilities that have green power programs where you pay a little bit extra amount a month uh, in exchange for them, um, you know, help support their purchasing of green power, the same thing must be available to gas um, customers. And so um, the question then becomes, well, where are they going to get all that renewable natural gas? Hold that thought. <laughs> Very important one. Meanwhile, there's, of course, the ongoing conversation of a carbon-weighted fuel standard, Washington State being the odd one out on the West Coast in terms of not having a carbon-weighted fuel standard. Um, it will be, again, a big issue this coming legislative session. Meanwhile, Puget Sound Clean Air Agency is talking about having a four-county central Puget Sound clean fuel standard if the state doesn't act. So that's a little bit of kabuki theater to keep your eyes on in the next few months. Um, there's also the new preferential purchasing requirement around both renewable natural gas and nutrients that get recovered from uh, handling organic wastes. I'll get back to that in a sec as well. Uh, and then there's the possibility of the UTC developing state level consistent pipeline quality standards for renewable natural gas injection. California is the only state that has them. So many gas utilities default to the California standard, which is very strict, very expensive, arguably in some circumstances excessive and others it might be appropriate. But whether or not it works in Washington and the challenges that it posed is an open conversation that the UTC will be having. 
We also have a million dollars in capital funds, thanks to the legislature this last session, to give out to dairy digesters to help them um, with energy efficiency improvements, um, nutrient recovery, biogas conditioning, various things to help them get off of the power sales model because utilities are no longer willing to pay what they once did because their compliance responsibilities under the RPS, under 937, are maxing out. So while they have this new 100% clean requirement, it's not the same market driver as the RPS originally was. You can't get double racks anymore, that kind of thing, uh, after next year. So um, they have to look at a different way of generating revenue, and part of that is nutrient recovery. And part and parcel to that is the big food waste reduction plan that ecology, along with health and agriculture, has been directed to prepare by October of 2020. 50% food waste and wasted food reduction by 2030. Um, so part of that is also about how do we handle our organic waste streams and how do we create value to drive that proposition. So some final thoughts. This afternoon, after I this, had this presentation put together, I thought, okay, if I'm sitting on the task force, I'm going to want to know how does this affect the st strategies and decisions potentially in Whatcom County. So I just have a couple other thoughts here I'd like to throw in, and then I look forward to your uh, questions during Q&A. So first question is why? Why RNG in, in Whatcom County? Um, first thoughts are obviously reduce methane emissions from organic waste decomposition in general. So for example, taking dairies off lagoon systems and uh, getting them into biogas capture. Um, in the process, creating usable energy it has value in many different ways, and including displacement of current fossil natural gas use. Um, it adds value to organic waste management solutions, for example, dairies, but not just dairies, um, um, uh, rendering facilities, uh, food processors, and so on. And it's a pathway to nutrient recovery, which is something that we've been funding along with WSU with a number of the dairies up here in Whatcom County, ways to pull phosphorus and nitrogen out of the manure streams in the process of biogas production and having that create value. So what might be RNG in Whatcom County? Um, it's not going to be your wastewater treatment or landfills. You know, unless there's a substantial investment in Post Point or someplace else and they're willing to take other sources of organic waste, which many wastewater treatment plant operators are very nervous about because they, they, you know, it's, it's easy to upset the biology in a treatment plant if you're not careful. So, but it's a potential opportunity. Um, but primarily, it's about your food processing waste, especially in the seafood industry, um, and the competing uses right now of that in animal feed and other uses. What's the highest and best use for that? Um, uh, waste management solutions for dairies, beef rendering, and so on. Post-consumer organics, too. And that's where, in, com in combination with composting community, you take those organic waste streams, you go through what's called high solids anaerobic digestion, um, and you can pull off a lot of the biogas there. It helps with odor control, it helps with vermin control, and it makes the resulting digestate a lot easier to go into composting systems. Um, and so then what are the major market drivers for this? Will the state adopt a clean fuel standard? Because if they do, then biogas in the transportation sector, I should say renewable natural gas, so biogas that's been conditioned up to uh, transportation quality, will be by far the biggest economic driver. But then again, we don't have a lot of CNG vehicles in Washington, so to be seen. Um, how will uh, Cascade and other gas utility programs in the state meet this new requirement for providing RNG to retail customers? How will that drive things? Because there's a 5% price cap. They can't charge more than 5% for the petroleum natural gas. Uh, and then what are the options for on-site and municipal waste management uh, on-site power generation and municipal management, um, regardless of the other bigger markets. So, uh, interesting set of open questions, and I look forward to a longer conversation with you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me to come speak. Uh, my name is John Bosch, and um, as, as David was saying, I, I presented similar materials uh, a few weeks ago to the um, County Climate Action Task Force. So if anybody was at that meeting, I, I apologize, there's not 100% duplication, but some, some amount of duplication uh, from, from that presentation. 
Uh, and I'm going to be talking about utility scale, uh, wind energy potential, and um, I have another presentation uh, from a friend of mine, Mia Devine, uh, who couldn't be here this evening, uh, so she, I'm going to give her a presentation for her. It's more about small scale or, or distributed um, uh, wind, wind potential. So first of all, just a, a brief advertisement for my company, Arcvera Renewables. Uh, we're a consulting firm uh, to the utility scale, uh, wind and solar industries. Um, we were uh, established in 2017 as a merger of my company and, and another little consulting company. We have about 26 people um, all around the world, uh, around the US, in Brazil, and in South Africa. Uh, we're headquartered in Golden, Colorado. And we have uh, four people here in Bellingham and a couple more in Seattle. Um, so anyway, that's a, just a little bit about us. Um, and that, so yeah, just talking a little bit about utility scale wind turbines and just sort of how the technology has involved, evolved over time, o over about the past 15 years. Um, in, in 2003, uh, wind turbines were, were about 50 to 75 meter rotor diameter, uh, around one megawatt, um, up to maybe a megawatt and a half in size. Uh, and then um, they've, they've grown over the, those 15 years now. The, Rotor diameter is typically anywhere from 100 to 150 meters in diameter. Uh, and um, the rated power might be between two to four and a half megawatts. Um, also, over that time, uh, the towers have gotten taller, uh, which has helped. But also, the, the wind turbines have become more efficient. So consequently, the, the bottom line is the, the um, net capacity factor is sort of the utilization. That's the energy produced divided by the energy that would be produced if they ran at 100% power all 24-7. So 15 years ago, that was typically in the neighborhood of 25 to 35%, and now it's 40% uh, and, and up to 55%. Those numbers kind of represent um, sites in the Great Plains. So I'll talk more about Washington State or specifically Whatcom County numbers in a minute. They're different than those numbers, but um, that's just a, a little bit to show kind of how the how the technology is, has grown and evolved. Um, and, and as that has happened, the, the cost of wind energy has come down uh, considerably, more than 50%, really. It was um, in 2003, I think we were uh, you know, looking really at like eight or nine cents a kilowatt hour. And um, this year, I mean, frankly, our clients would give their eye teeth if they could get two cents a kilowatt hour uh, in, in the Great Plains. And so, um, the costs have really come down significantly. Um, so it's just some examples of some commercial offerings of wind turbines on the market. This is GE's latest. Well, you may have heard of GE's Halliade wind turbine, which is a 12 megawatt. That's really intended for offshore use. Uh, I'm not talking about offshore here. I, I'm happy to talk about it. There's possibly some offshore potential, but that's kind of um, really a, quite a ways out for, for our waters. Uh, here, but for on, onshore, GE has a, a 5.8 megawatt, 158 meter rotor diameter. Um, really, a, a big uh, and interesting um, wind turbine. It uses journal bearings for the first time in any wind turbine, etc. Uh, the blades come in two pieces because they can't be transported as one piece, so they come in two pieces that get assembled on the site. Um, Vestas has a, 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 is a Danish wind turbine manufacturer uh, with their US headquarters in Portland and uh, manufacturing in Colorado. And they have 162 meter rotor diameter uh, with 5.6 megawatts rating. Th these are really the very biggest turbines just coming onto the market. The ones we are kind of installing right now today are, are a little bit smaller than this, maybe more in the two, three, four megawatt kind of size range. But, but this, these are kind of the new product offerings on the market. Uh, Siemens and, and a Spanish company called Gamesa uh, merged last year. And so they, Siemens Gamesa is now one of the, I think they're now the second biggest uh, turbine manufacturer. And they have a, um, a wind turbine with 170 meter rotor diameter and a 5.8 megawatt rating. Um, and so, yeah, just a, just a little bit of kind of about how the, the technology is evolved. And, and then now maybe I'll talk a little bit about the, the wind resource here locally within Whatcom County. Um, so this is just a map of, of Whatcom County uh, kind of cropped around the, the borders of the county. I stopped it right around sort of Mount Baker. I didn't go all the way out to the very eastern part of the county, uh, which is nat National Forest and National Park. But um, 
looking, uh, first of all, just to kind of orienting yourself to what's what um, in the geography, then overlaying uh, a wind resource map. Uh, this one is, I have three of these maps. I'll, I'll put them up one after the other. But this one is created by NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And um, you can see, I, I don't know, it's a, the font is a little bit small there. But most of the county is anywhere from light blue to dark blue. That, that light blue represents um, kind of five to five and a half meters per second. The, the very lightest blue kind of out near Cherry Point there is five and a half to six meters per second. So that's kind of the range of wind speeds that we're looking at, uh, sort of in the five to six meter per second range. Uh, you can see on tops of some of the hills, um, for example, Sumas Mountain, uh, Galbraith Mountain, et cetera, there's a little bit higher wind speed there, maybe um, uh, six or six and a half, maybe even up to seven. Uh, meters per second on some of those hills. Uh, they can be fairly steep and, and would no doubt be problematic to get wind turbines, especially the really big wind turbines up there. It, it, it could be possible to, to build some up there, but um, it's a little bit more of a challenge on, on tops of those hills, uh, not to mention environmental uh, challenges building there. So a, a similar map from a, a Finnish company called Visola. Uh, and they have a, a group in Seattle that does wind mapping. This is a little bit higher resolution map than the NREL map, but same thing. You can see kind of right around Cherry Point and along the coast from there up to Birch Bay, there's a, a, an area with a, about five and a half meters per second, uh, again at 100 meter hub height. Um, and then the tops of the hills are kind of in the seven to seven and a half meter um, range. So a little bit higher wind on tops of the hills, uh, but again with the challenges of building there. And then a third map, um, this one created by a, a, a UL, uh, the, the same company that certifies your toaster and microwave and whatnot. Um, but they have a wind energy consulting group uh, in Albany, New York, and, and they produce wind maps. So this is even a higher yet uh, resolution map, but it's at an 80 meter height instead of the 100 meter height. Uh, nevertheless, it shows similar similar results, kind of in the five to five and a half meter per second range along the, along the coast there. Um, and, and again, some little higher, higher winds on tops of the hills. So just kind of summarizing those a little bit, uh, the winds five to five and a half meters per second near the coast. Uh, you could extend, those were 80 and 100 meter uh, hub height maps. So if you extended with a taller tower, uh, you, uh, the kind of tallest towers we're seeing these days are typically about 120 meters. If you used a tall tower like that, you, you might you know, reasonably get something like six meters per second at, at that height. Um, and then on the hilltops, maybe six and a half to seven and a half meters per second. Those, those are all just based on these wind maps. The wind maps have a good bit of uncertainty, say, say plus or minus 10%. Uh, there haven't been very many measurements actually taken here. Uh, certainly at heights over about 10 meters, for example, at the airport. Um, but, but, you know, they're, they're reasonable indications of what we'd expect. And then that compares to if, if you were to, you know, look at wind speeds for eastern Washington, say in the Columbia Gorge, uh, the Kittitas Valley, uh, really almost anywhere in the Palouse, uh, those wind speeds range from 7 to 8 meters per second. So, um, Again, a little bit higher even than what we might have on the hilltops here in Washington. And the advantage there is there's a lot of open, uh, open terrain where you can achieve some economies of scale. The, the sites we have here, you know, along the coast, uh, Cherry Point or something, are probably big enough for a few tens of megawatts. Um, and, and again, on the hilltops, maybe another few tens of megawatts. I, I don't know, in the whole county, maybe 50 or 100 megawatts, something like that. And I think, um, you know, to meet our energy needs, I, I haven't done the calculation, but I'd wager to bet it would be several, several hundred megawatts that we would need um, really to meet our, our energy needs. So um, really to achieve that kind of scale, you're probably looking at uh, either some combination of other, other energy sources or, you know, for, for that kind of bulk generation, uh, importing power from, from Eastern Washington. And, and I use Eastern Washington as, ex, as an example, but it could come from, you know, Montana or Wyoming or anywhere that we're connected through um, transmission lines. Actually, transmission lines that increasingly have available capacity because of coal, coal plants going offline. Um, so, uh, and then again, just some comparisons. Uh, uh, wind speed, the, the net capacity factor, again, that's, you know, the energy generated divided by the energy that would be generated if it, the wind turbine ran at 100% capacity all the time. 
Um, and then sort of an approximate cost of energy. Uh, so along the coast in Whatcom County, you're talking maybe eight cents a kilowatt hour in the low 20s for, for capacity factor. Uh, if, if you extend it up to a taller tower along the coast, uh, probably getting more into the higher 20s, mid to high 20s uh, for capacity factor, and then reducing the cost maybe down to something in the neighborhood of seven cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, on the hilltops around here, if, the, if those higher wind speeds shown on the wind map are, are, are real, and they could be wrong, but if they're real, uh, you know, you might start to get down to something closer to five cents a kilowatt hour. I, I don't know, the construction difficulties might push that number a little bit higher, um, but, but probably a little, little better economy on those higher, higher wind speeds on the hills. And then coming, you know, importing power from eastern Washington, probably more like four cents a kilowatt hour. And, and I was mentioning, you know, my, our clients that are de wind developers in Montana, Wyoming, et cetera, they'd give their eye teeth for two cents a kilowatt hour. So um, there's really cheap wind available from outside of the region. Uh, locally, locally generated uh, wind energy is going to be is going to be more. Exp th there's a possibility of some, but it would be a little more expensive. Um, and then uh, I, I wanted to give an example of a project that we worked on a few years ago uh, that is locally generated um, wind energy in the west side of the state. Uh, this was this was a really fun project to get to work on. Kind of. Personally, it was one of the more rewarding projects that, that I've worked on um, in my career. It was uh, built by Coastal Community Action uh, Project. Um, it's their local, uh, um, uh, you know, they do Meals on, we Meals on Wheels and en low income energy uh, assistance and whatnot. It's a social services agency. Uh, and they're, their low-income energy guy uh, had the idea of using all their low-income energy money to just buy small wind turbines and hand them out to their low-income residents. And um, I convinced him that that would probably be a, a fairly bad idea. Then he thought, well, what if we just pool all of our money and buy a really big wind turbine? And I thought, mm, well, it's still kind of a bad idea, but you can give it a try. So he started pushing and pushing and pushing, and he, he just wouldn't give up no matter what happened. And a few years later, they were able to build uh, a four wind turbine project, e each one and a half megawatts. This was, um, I think, 2007 or something like that when they built their project. And uh, so six megawatts. Uh, and um, they were able to use the production tax credits which any anybody can get. They also were able to use something called new market tax credits, which are available for um, uh, kind of um, projects that, that benefit low-income areas. And uh, so they kind of double-dipped on the tax credits. They also got a little grant from the state. And uh, consequently, that project, now that it's up and running, provides about a half a million dollars a year uh, to their, for their social services agency. Um, it's a really great um, example of kind of, uh, uh, you know, locally, local generation that then feeds benefits back into the community. Uh, here's a picture of their four wind turbines up on the, on the hill near, near Grayland, Washington. This is kind of, you can see the cranberry bog in the, fore, in the foreground there along the coast. Uh, and then there's a, just, a, again, another picture of the site. Um, so uh, some, some just key messages that I wanted to uh, um, uh, people to sort of take away from this. The, the wind energy technology is really de developing rapidly and, and the costs are declining quickly. Uh, it, here in Whatcom County, we have a moderate wind resource. Um, there are some developable sites, probably not for more than you know a few tens of megawatts um, and at a little higher cost. And then. Uh, there's a better wind resource uh, in eastern Washington or, or further afield in Montana and Wyoming. Um, uh, and there's been at least one other wind project here in western Washington. With a, Their wind speed, by the way, on that coastal project was 6.6 .6 meters per second, so kind of similar to what we have here in the county, maybe a little bit windier. Um, and uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was, that was it for, for my presentation. Um, again, I'll save, my, save, uh, save your questions for me until the Q&A period. And then I'm going to try to do my best to, um, to deliver uh, my friend Mia's uh, presentation. I'll, I'll go through it as quick as I can. Mia is um, uh, a friend of mine. She works for an organization called Spark Northwest. Uh, they, they promote um, community-based uh, renewable energy generation, and especially distributed generation. So she had a presentation about, about small-scale wind. 
Uh, and really, d just again, pointing out the distinctions between the small turbines there on the left, medium size uh, in the middle, and then the large utility scale on, on the right. Um, the cost of the small, this, this doesn't apply to the big utility scale wind turbines that I was talking about, but just those small wind turbines has actually been going up in recent years uh, at the same time that solar costs have been coming down uh, fairly dramatically. This graph only goes out to 2013, but I can tell you that those, those trends continue up until today. Um, and it is, um, it's just been a tough market for the companies that make those small wind turbines. A, a number of them have gone out of business. We, we only have one or two companies really still in business now. Um, but you can see as the number of installations of solar projects have gone up, you know, sort of exponentially over the past few years, these, ut these uh, distributed wind generation projects are in, in the single digits across the whole country. So it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty small market for distributed um, kind of residential scale wind. Uh, buyer beware, there's a, there's a certification pro program for small wind turbines. So if someone were going to buy a small wind turbine, I'd recommend they look for one that's certified. Uh, there are some really weird and bizarre kind of, you could argue, sculptural wind turbines. But all of these uh, ones that are pictured here, those companies are now out of business. So, you know, it, it's, usually not a, it's usually not a good gamble that uh, there's going to be a company there to stand behind warranty obligations and whatnot. Um, and then uh, Mia wanted to talk a little bit about um, wind energy in the built environment. So this is wind turbines on urban buildings or, or even on houses for that matter. Uh, there was a study done by NREL uh, on this topic a few years ago. And so just some of the, some of the takeaways, they looked at uh, a number of case studies of uh, wind turbines on, on buildings, uh, generally in fairly urban environments. One you might be familiar with, uh, I don't see a, a picture. In Portland, yeah, do you see it there? 12 West in the middle. 12 West in the middle on top, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, and it, it'll show up a slide or two later because it's um, uh, focused on. But one of the lessons, some of the lessons learned, it's really difficult to predict what the wind will be on top of one of these buildings. There's just really complex wind flow around or over the top of a building. And so you might think there's a good wind resource, but you know, then you know just obstructions from the building or nearby buildings um, uh, can fool you. And so um, of, the, of the six uh, case studies they looked at, none of them met the expected energy that they were supposed to get. In fact, um, 12 West, as an example, was supposed to make about 9,000 kilowatt hours a year, an 11% capacity factor, which is quite low to begin with. Uh, and they really only achieved about a 7% capacity factor. So it was a very disappointing um, result. Uh, it turned out to be the cost of energy is about four and a half dollars a kilowatt hour, not, not in cents per kilowatt hour. So this is maybe more of a, you know, virtue signaling or, or greenwashing to kind of try to advertise their apartment building. But um, it is not in any way, shape, or form an economic uh, way of, of generating electricity. Um, yeah, the capacity factors on all of these projects were anywhere from 1% to 7%. So the, it, it just is, the, the idea here is uh, don't, don't think of this as a solution for Bellingham, please. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the end of it. <laughs> All right, so you have to forgive me. I have a cold. Um, Bellingham Public School started last week, so it's right on schedule. Um, you don't have to forgive me for anything in the presentation, though. If something goes right, that's. Oh, OK. Serve the task force. OK, so the, um, let me, Google Sheets, how do I get this to? go big, present. All right. So I was tasked with calculating the increased electricity demand from um, fuel switching. So switching from electric vehicles or internal combustion vehicles to electric vehicles. That's going to increase electricity demand because now we're powering our vehicles with electricity. Electrification of gas-fired app appliances, so taking your water heater and your furnace and switching it to heat pumps. That's going to increase electricity demand. Population growth, electricity demand is increasing in Bellingham year on year, uh, regardless of what, what we're doing. 
And one thing that will decrease electricity demand would be energy efficiency, but uh, I ran out of time to include that in this talk. So take this as worst case scenario. Um, this would be the maximum amount of electricity we would need to go completely off of uh, fossil fuels, gasoline for cars, natural gas for our homes and commercial buildings. Okay, so to today's demand, uh, we're pushing about three quarters of a terawatt hour per year. Um, 285 gigawatt hours comes from residential, 379 uh, gigawatt hours come from commercial buildings. I didn't include industrial buildings in this analysis. Um, our natural gas demand is 4.5 uh, tera BTUs, 1.3 for res, 0.87 for commercial, and 2.23 for industrial. So the bulk is going to industry there. Um, now some pertinent growth rates, so this, this isn't static. So if we're gonna project into the future, we have to think about how we're growing. Um, population is increasing at 1.44% year on year. Electricity demand is actually increasing beyond just simple population growth, and that's because um, people are living better and becoming more and more comfortable, uh, despite what you may see around you. Um, this is an established fact. Um, natural gas demand is increasing far more rapidly than population and electricity demand alone, and that's because of the significant depression in spot price of natural gas due to horizontal drilling and fracking in the 2000s, and so now it becomes uh, uh, more economical uh, for a home buyer to uh, purchase natural gas appliances versus electric appliances. Now we start having heat pumps, and so some of that economies uh, are changing. They're becoming more on parity. But the increasing natural gas demand has been significant in the last 20 years or so because of fracking. All right, so this is baseline demand projection, just considering um, population growth and that uh, baseline electricity growth. Again, we're about three quarters of a terawatt hour today. Um, by 2035, we're gonna be up to an entire uh, terawatt hour of electricity required for Bellingham um, for a year, right? Let's look at how this will increase by fuel switching. So let's start with electrification of vehicles first. Um, Bellingham, we currently drive 600 million miles per year. The carbon intensity per vehicle mile traveled is 0.4 kilograms. This is assuming a 22 mile per gallon internal combustion engine. That's the, that's the standard. Um, uh, let's put this on equal unit basis. So if we converted uh, um, gallons of gasoline to kilowatt hours of energy, there's energy in that gasoline, so we can measure that and then convert it to another energy unit kilowatt hours. So that's about 32.78 kilowatt hours per gallon of E10 fuel. That's what you put in your tank. You don't put in racing fuel. When it says maybe up to ethanol 10%, it's exactly at 10%. It's cheaper to sell ethanol than to sell real gasoline. So that's 1.49 kilowatt hours per mile. We can compare that to a Tesla Model S 100D. That's 0.317 kilowatt hours per mile. So it's about um, four to five times more efficient, and that's because uh, um, going from electricity to mechanical is is you know 90 to 95 percent efficient. Lighting something on fire and trying to make a wheel turn that's only about 20 percent efficient. Most of that goes out the tailpipe or into your radiator. Okay, so to do this, we have to consider these efficiencies. Start with the total of BMT for Bellingham, we have that. Look at the um, baseline electricity demand for EVs by considering these different efficiencies. And then we can also consider uh, VMT reduction scenarios, which I have done, but I will not include in this presentation because again, this is worst case scenario. So that's that yellow line down there. So it will increase um, electricity demand instantaneously by a few hundred uh, gigawatt hours, and then by about 200 gigawatt hours by 2035 assuming standard population growth rates. Again, this will be maybe cut in half if we do things like urbanization, um, uh, promoting biking, et cetera. All right, so now switching to residential and commercial fuel switching. Similar sort of analysis, we have to first figure out how much we're using today in terms of natural gas, and then determine how much natural gas is used in each end-use appliance, because different appliances have different efficiencies, especially once you switch from natural gas to heat pumps. So then determine the energy required for that electric upgrade. It's gonna be less, right? Um, because they're much more efficient. And then finally, calculate the overall electric load impact. So let's start with how we use natural gas uh, in Bellingham today. 
Uh, this survey is dated. It's for Alaska, Hawaii, Washington, and Oregon. That's the, the best granul granularity I could find so far. I asked CNGC for better granu granularity. I got some good data about total gas use, but not how it's actually used in the home. Um, there's more recent surveys from the EIA, but they, they, they're only for Pacific region, and clearly we're not San Diego, so that's not gonna be useful. Okay, so we use about two-thirds of our gas for space heating, one-third for water heating, a little bit for cooking. That kind of makes sense. Look at your gas bill. Look at how much money you spend in the winter versus how much you spend in the summer. You're taking the same shower you are in the summer as you are in the winter, but you're heating your house in the winter, right? So that's the natural gas end use. Let's look at some of these efficiencies. This is natural gas in homes. I don't have time for this as a function of square feet. Turns out the smaller houses are more electrified than the bigger houses. Makes sense, richer people use more energy. Okay, so gas equipment um, has efficiencies of about 90% for space heat and 68% for water heating. Water heating's less efficient uh, because you're A, bringing it to a much higher temperature, right, 120F instead of 68F, and then um, B, you have to store that temperature for a longer period of time. Comparing that to electric appliances, these are all heat pumps. It depends on the delta T. What does delta T mean? It means the differential in temperature from your appliance and or the space you're trying to heat and the outside environment. So the delta T is less in July. That's why they're more efficient in July, right? It's warmer in July. It's easier to move heat from outside into your home in July than it is in February when there is no heat outside. Okay, so if we average that over the year, uh, we get these average efficiencies of about 340% for space heating, heat pumps, and 223 for water heating. So gas, right off the bat, uses three to four times more energy, just on a per energy basis. So if we look at the increased electricity demand based on the number of houses in Bellingham and which ones are using gas and for what reasons, then we get these four curves down here. The dotted line is space heating. Again, that's gonna be bigger than everything else because we use two thirds of our gas for space heating. And then we have some residential water heating. And then we have cooking. Cooking jumped up more significantly than anything else on a you know, percentage basis, and that's because there's no efficiency gain from cooking with gas. You're just still making heat. You're not moving heat. So it's 100% it's efficient at making heat, but um, you're not gonna get above 100%. Add those lines up, you get the orange line there. Similar analysis for commercial. Um, commercial uh, has much higher cooking demand, and that's because <coughs> of restaurants. And they even use uh, natural gas refrigerators, right? You can still drive a heat pump with natural gas, and if you need a big refrigerator, it may be more economical to have a natural gas fridge. Um, yeah, so there's that. So it's the commercial demand is slightly bigger than the residential, but it's on a comparable basis. Looking at EVs, commercial, and residential space, then we get that red, I mean orange, blue, and yellow line down there. Add them all up, and we get that green line. And so it's significant, right? This is, this is about 80%, 60 to 80% of our current electricity demand. Adding that to our projected baseline growth, the black line, then we need you know, 1.75 terawatt hours of electricity by 2035. That's a big jump. That's a big reach. Uh, based on John's wind talk right there, if we need to add a terawatt hour of electricity divided by 8760 hours a year, then we need um, a couple hundred, 100 megawatts, but a capacity factor of 0.4, so that's gonna be like 240 megawatts, so we'll need like, I don't know, 100 of those big turbines in eastern Washington uh, over 15 years, so that's like seven turbines per year. So it is a big ask, but it's not, uh, it's not impossible. You gotta build seven turbines a year, wind turbines. Okay, so that's my analysis on projected uh, demand. Um, still have some more minutes, so I'm gonna talk about the uh, greenhouse gas adjustment from doing this. So the red is continuing to burn gas, business as usual, assuming population growth and natural gas uh, growth usage. <coughs> um, so we're push, starting to push like 200, 300, uh, thousand tons per year. And so this is about half of total uh, um, community emissions today. We're at like 700, 800,000 
kilotons per year. We switched to PSE, so electrify everything, cars, appliances, then we cut that in more than half, um, probably even more so as, as coal strip goes offline. And if we switch entirely to renewables, then we get to that negligible amount just associated with life cycle emissions, still emit a little CO2 when you build a solar panel or wind turbine. So this is clearly, despite you know, the heavy lift of getting all that electricity, we'll get rid of all, all emissions, right? Because the, we'll have emission-free electricity powering these different appliances and vehicles. So how much will this cost? Um, we can start with a previous study. This is for Toronto, looking at marginal abatement cost curves. So this, how, how much does it cost to uh, alleviate a ton of uh, CO2? Um, high efficiency heat pumps, <coughs> about negative $500 per ton. So you actually save money because you're consuming less energy, paying for less fuel. Now this is Toronto prices. Our natural gas is much cheaper than Toronto. So we're actually slightly positive. Patrick and I did the analysis here. I'll show it in a sec. Um, compare that for, to tankless water heaters. They're, they're less effective, but still negative. Um, high efficiency electric storage water heaters, so heat pumps, deeply negative. <coughs> Comparing that to biogas, um, biogas you start have to pay money to abate carbon. All right, so this is Toronto's analysis. We did a little bit of our own analysis, so I have to switch over to a spreadsheet because I didn't have time to, this is hot off the press, right? Okay, so this is space heating marginal abatement cost curve. Uh, here's some cost estimates. Installed cost range, so not just to buy the appliance, but to pay somebody to put it in your house and take away your old one. This is from Home Advisor web, website for Washington. Um, this is low estimates, high estimates for a gas furnace versus a heat pump. Um, heat pumps are about double the gas furnace or significantly uh, greater when in these big, big, you know, 3,000 square foot installations. And so you can amortize these costs. You can apply a discount rate. You can add the annual fuel costs, an analysis that I did not see on that Facebook ad whatsoever. Um, and then you get these annualized costs. And that's the figure of merit, um, not the initial capital costs, because you actually have to pay to run these things, right? And so here are the um, yearly costs, uh, the maximum cost, the minimum cost based on these different price differentials for a furnace versus a heat pump. Heat pump is more expensive than a furnace, even once you calculate uh, operating costs, but drastic reductions in CO2. And so the total cost, the marginal cost, the differential cost for a Bellingham, if we electrified all of our appliances, um, or all of our space heating, that is, would be $20 million per year. Um, maximum minimum cost would be $2 million per year. More ties per person, this is $220 per person per year. I think, I mean, four beers, we can do that, right? CO2 savings are quite significant. If we look at um, switching from natural gas to PSE's grid, then we'll reduce uh, by 50,000 kilotons. Or yeah, 50,000 tons per year. If we go full renewable, it'll be 66,000 uh, tons per year. If we replaced all of our natural gas with biogas and kept our old gas appliances, then the reduction would only be 13,000 uh, tons per year. So 80% um, less reduced CO2 if we go the biogas route. All right, um, back to my presentation. I um, have maybe one minute left, so I'm going to talk a little bit about biogas disadvantages because it's my show. Um, terrible systems efficiency. You saw the plot where you had to go through all those different chains, converting energy stage after stage after stage to get ultimately usable 90 gas at 97 at 90 percent methane purity. It goes further back than that. You start with the sun, right? And then the sun goes into grass and then goes into a cow. Uh, you can cut all those pathways down to just sun and a solar panel. Or you can go through everything else, and they'll, they'll take their thermodynamic take. Um, it's an impure gas stream. Once you generate biogas, it's only 50% methane. The other half is CO2, a greenhouse gas. Um, there's significant supply constraints, limits applicability to rural areas. Luckily, we're blessed with a lot of rural areas here. Um, estimate for gas supply supplementation is 1 to 20%. This agrees with uh, the analysis we saw earlier today. 
<clears throat> 20 percent again was that super aggressive high end. It's way too expensive. Best biogas prices today are around $60 per ton. This is twice Henry spot price. Uh, if we applied a carbon tax to that gas, it'd be a carbon tax of $295. Uh, and again, $100 is completely unpalatable. Um, it's food versus fuel, so it's not going to be a global solution. Um, if we're feeding these things with cows, uh, they're already the most carbon intensive food, beef and dairy. So, I mean, cancer for the cure, right? Um, how many cows for Bellingham would we need? One dairy cow can produce 0.4 tons of methane per year. Currently, there are 47,000 dairy cows in Whatcom County, 1,100 producing biogas at the Vanderhoek Dairy. Bellingham direct combustion gas demand is 4.5 million mega BTUs per year. Therefore, we'd need 218,000 cows, or 4.63 times the amount of dairy cows we have today. Therefore, we would need 200 uh, Vanderhoek dairies. Renewable biogas is not a clean fuel. It still emits four grams per megajoule of carbon uh, dioxide, 21 grams per megajoule if we're going for food waste. Um, cow waste is better than food waste. They eat better than us. They don't eat fat, right? Um, <clears throat> so uh, today, Bellingham emits 326 million kilograms of CO2 per year from direct combustion of natural gas. If all of it was biogas emissions, we would be 60 my, we would have the 69 million kilogram reduction. So we would reduce our emissions by 78% if we switch from natural gas to biogas. That's awesome. Let's do it. Oh, but wait, what about the life cycle emissions? What, we're not just talking about burning the gas. Where did the gas come from? It came from a cow. They burp. In fact, 95% of methane emanates from their mouth. You can't capture that. It doesn't go into the digester. Each cow burps 30 to 50 gallons of methane per day. At a global warming potential of 84, this yields 4.4 tons of CO2 equivalent per year per cow. To satisfy Bellingham's natural gas demand, we would need 218,000 cows. These cows would burp 9, 1 million tons of CO2 per year. Bellingham commu community emits in total 780,000 tons of CO2 per year. Congrats, by switching to biogas, we have more than doubled our emissions. Overrun the county with cows, deflated the price of milk by at least 5x, which is already a problem with Canadians coming to Costco, and doubled the price of gas. 